Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Brad Mussel, and this is a reading of the Utility of Religion, Mill, Nietzsche, and James. This will be part five of chapter two, Frederick Nietzsche and the Antichrist. Again, this is part five, Nietzsche's Remedy, Revaluation of All Values. As I've intimated, intimated throughout this chapter, Nietzsche seems to view himself as being, first and foremost, a kind of psychologist, primarily interested in the science of human nature. Consider, for instance, some of his topics in the Antichrist where he discusses, among other things, the psychology of the Redeemer, footnote 366 cites the source, the psychology and constitution of Jesus Christ, footnote 367 cites the source, the psychology of redemption, footnote 368 cites the source, quote, the psychology of the evangel, and quote, footnote 369 cites the source, quote, the psychology of every Shandala mor morality, and quote, footnote 370 cites the source, the quote, Psychology of the Opposing Concepts of Noble Morality and Resentment Morality, end quote, footnote 371 cites the source, and the Psychology of Faith, footnote 372 cites the source. Also consider the title of Kaufman's celebrated classic on Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Philosopher, Psychologist, Antichrist. What's more, Wicks, when reflecting on Nietzsche's final work, Esse Homo, suggests that in view of his own aptitude for psychological observation, quote, Nietzsche claims to be wise as a consequence of his acute aesthetic sensitivity to nuances of health and sickness, sickness in people's attitudes and character. End quote. Footnote 373 cites the source. In fact, as Wicks points out, many interpret Nietzsche's famous notion of eternal recurrence as both a measure of psychological health and as a means of promoting it. Footnote 374. There is no consensus among scholars regarding the true meaning behind Nietzsche's doctrine of eternal recurrence. And there is much debate over whether Nietzsche primarily intended for it to, one, express a cosmological theory about how the world is, or instead, two, serve as a kind of life-affirming instrument. Those endorsing a cosmological interpretation claim Nietzsche is suggesting that the universe consists of a finite number of physical entities and that time is infinite, in which case every possibility will inevitably become actualized and everything actualized will eventually occur again and again, eternally. There does seem to, be, seem to be some support for this interpretation. Consider, for example, what Zarathustra says in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Quote, Must not whatever can walk have walked on this lane before? Must not whatever can ha happen have happened, have been done, have passed by before? End quote. I cite the source. Alternatively, other scholars suggest that the idea of eternal recurrence is best viewed as a kind of instrument for affirming one's life in this world. Along these lines, Wicks writes that, quote, Nietzsche's doctrine of eternal recurrence serves to draw attention away from all worlds other than the one in which we presently live, since eternal recurrence precludes the possibility of any final escape from the present world. Similarly, in his acclaimed history of Western philosophy, Frederick Copleston claims that, quote, the theory of eternal recurrence was a test of strength, of Nietzsche's power to say yes to life instead of a Schopenhauerian no, uh, end quote. And that, quote, the theory of eternal recurrence expresses Nietzsche's resolute will to this worldliness, end quote. On this account, we see how Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence is thought to counteract the unhealthy influence of religion and its nihilistic otherworldly emphases. End of footnote 374. I'll go ahead and read that sentence again. In fact, as Wicks points out, many interpret Nietzsche's famous notion of eternal recurrence as both a measure of psychological health and as a means of promoting it, footnote 374. In this vein, Wicks observes that, quote, the doctrine also functions as a measure of judging someone's overall psychological strength and mental health, since Nietzsche believed that the doctrine of eternal recurrence was the hardest worldview to affirm, end quote, footnote 375 cites the source. And he points out that some scholars believe that the doctrine of eternal recurrence offers, quote, one way to interpret the world among many, many others, which if adopted therapeutically as a psychologically healthy myth, can help us become stronger, end quote. Footnote 376 cites the source. In essence, Nietzsche seems to fancy himself a kind of doctor who specializes in mental health. There can be no doubt that Nietzsche believes he has a, has a penchant for health, as he routinely says things like, quote, it is my privilege to have the finest sense for all signs of healthy instincts. I do not have any sickly features, end quote. Footnote 377 cites the source. Provided Nietzsche truly is adept at diagnosing sickness in people's attitudes and characters, it remains to be seen whether his potential cure for these mental ills, the revaluation of all values, actually proves to be an effective remedy. Contrary to the anti-natural and nihilistic values of Christianity and other religions, as well as of atheism as practiced by Schopenhauer and others, Nietzsche himself advocates natural values and adamantly preaches the affirmation of life throughout his works. 
In Nietzsche's view, life is never something to bemoan, and his life-affirming mentality is at odds with the pessimistic pr perspective of the slave. Footnote 378. Interestingly, Nietzsche suffered a great deal of pain during his life. In fact, he was often violently ill and suffered from migraine headaches as well as numerous other chronic ailments throughout his life. If anyone had reason to embrace Schopenhauer's pessimism and to dwell on the pain and suffering implicit in life, it would be Nietzsche. Footnote 379. In chapter 3, Nietzsche's optimistic demeanor toward, toward life compels me to question James's contention that Nietzsche is overly brooding and pessimistic. End of footnote 379. This, and I'm going to go ahead and read that sentence again. In Nietzsche's view, life is never something to bemoan, and his life-affirming mentality is, is at odds with the pessimistic perspective of the slave. Footnotes 378 and 379. This is why, in describing the viewpoint of the free and noble kind of individual, i.e. masters like himself, he writes that, quote, nothing can be tolerated less in this type than ugly manners or a pessimistic look. An eye that makes things ugly, end quote. Footnote 380 cites the source, and, quote, the critic of Christianity cannot help but make Christianity look despicable. End quote. Footnote 381 cites the source. From the perspective of Nietzsche and other masters, quote, the world is perfect. This is how the instinct of the most spiritual people speaks, the yes-saying instinct. End quote. Footnote 382 cites the source. Not surprisingly, Nietzsche concludes the Antichrist by officially condemning Christianity, saying, quote, I condemn Christianity. I indict the Christian church on the most terrible charges an accuser has ever had in his mouth. I consider it the greatest corruption conceivable. End quote. Footnote 383 cites the source. What's more, he adds that, quote, the Christian church, Christian church has not left anything untouched by its cor corruption, end quote, but no 384 cites the source, and says, quote, I call Christianity the one great curse, end quote, but no 385 cites the source. Making matters worse for Nietzsche, slaves disrupt the appearance and flourishing of masters, and he routinely points out how the interests of masters and slaves are at odds with each other. Accordingly, in section three of the Antichrist, he writes, quote, this more valuable type has appeared often enough already, but only a stroke of luck as an exception, never as willed. In fact, he was precisely what people feel, feared more, most. So far, he has been practically the paradigm of the terrible. And out of terror, the opposite type was willed, bred, and achieved. The domestic animal, the herd animal, the sick animal, man, the Christian. End quote. Footnote 386 cites the source. Also, he suggests that Christian values and noble values provide, quote, the greatest opposition of values there is, end quote, footnote 387 cites the source, given that, quote, Christianity is a rebellion of everything that crawls on the ground against everything that has height, end quote, footnote 388 cites the source, and that the church forms a, quote, deadly hostility to everything honest, to every height of the soul, to every discipline of spirit, to every, everything kind and candid in humanity, end quote, footnote 389 cites the source. It should not be surprising that since, quote, the grand pose is stuck by, struck by these six spirit, six, let me try this again. It should be, should not be surprising that since, quote, the grand pose is struck by these six, six spirits, this conceptual epileptic can affect the great masses, end quote. Footnote 390 cites the source. Christianity won, and with this, a nobler sensibility was destroyed, end quote. Footnote 391 cites the source, which leads Nietzsche to conclude that, quote, Christianity has been the worst thing to happen to humanity so far, end quote. Footnote 392 cites the source. In fact, he puts Christians on par with anarchists, suggesting that, quote, both are decadence. Neither one can do anything except dissolve, poison, lay waste, bleed dry. Both have instincts of mortal hatred against everything that stands, that stands tall, that has endurance, that promises life a future. End quote. Footnote 393 cites the source. Nietzsche goes so far as to suggest Christians rendered, quote, the entire work of the ancient world in vain. End quote. Footnote 394 cites the source. Expounding on this idea, he writes, quote, Greeks. Romans, the nobility of the instincts and of taste, defiled by sly, secretive, invisible, anemic vampires, not defeated, just sucked dry, the hidden need for revenge, petty jealousy, come to power, everything miserable, suffering from itself, plagued by bad feelings, the whole ghetto world of the soul, risen to the top in a single stroke, end quote, footnote 395 cites the source. In general, Nietzsche alleges that, quote, the church waged mortal combat on every noble, everything noble on earth. End quote. Footnote 396 cites the source. Furthermore, Nietzsche expresses contempt for his contemporaries, who he believes have become aware of the lies and falsities associated with the church, and yet continue to allow priests and other forms of religious decadence to persist and dominate society. In fact, he feels so incensed by this religious tolerance that he describes his feelings towards it as, quote, blacker than the blackest melancholy, end quote. Footnote 397 cites the source. 
While he suggests that he is, quote, careful not to hold humanity responsible for its mental illness, illnesses, end quote, footnote 398 cites the source, he clearly is not so patient when it comes to his contemporaries, writing that, quote, our age knows better, end quote, footnote 399 cites the source, and that, quote, what used to be just sickness is indecency today, end quote, footnote 400 cites the source. He adds that, quote, the concepts beyond, last judgment, immortality of the soul, the soul itself, these are instruments of torture. These are systems of cruelty that enable the priest to gain control, maintain control. Everyone knows this, and yet everything goes on as before, end quote. Footnote 401 cites the source. He is particularly upset with his fellow Germans, suggesting that, quote, if we do not get rid of Christianity, it will be the fault of the Germans, end quote. Footnote 402 cites the source, and that Germans, quote, have robbed Europe of the last great cultural harvest that it still could have brought home, the Renaissance, end quote, footnote 403 cites the source. Nietzsche believes that the Renaissance offered a valuable opportunity for, quote, the revaluation of all Christian values, an attempt using all means, all instincts, all genius, to allow the opposite values, noble values, to triumph, end quote, footnote 404 cites the source, which, quote, would have been the, the, the victory that I am the only one demanding these days. With this, Christianity was abolished, end quote. Footnote 405 cites the source. According to Nietzsche, this opportunity was wasted with the arrival of Martin Luther. As he puts it, quote, what happened? A German monk, Luther, came to Rome, end quote. Footnote 406 cites the source. Nietzsche claims that Luther, quote, had all the vindictive instincts of a wounded priest, end quote. Footnote 407 cites the source. And, quote, flew into a rage in Rome against the Renaissance, uh, end quote. Footnote 408 cites the source. Moreover, in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche expresses similar concerns about slave moral theories, which again, most religions incorporate, writing, quote, in all sciences and morals, so far one thing was lacking, strange as it may sound, the problem of morality itself. What was lacking was any suspicion that there was something problematic here. What the philosophers called a rational foundation for morality and tried to supply was, seen in the right light, merely a scholarly variation of the common faith in the prevalent morality, a new means of expression for this faith, Certainly the very opposite of an examination, analysis, questioning, and vivisection of this very faith. End quote. Footnote 409 cites the source. The implication here is that moral philosophers, who are themselves slaves, have done nothing but reinforce the slave mentality. Indeed, the slave mentality seems to be present in all walks of life. And this is a point that Nietzsche painfully recognizes. However, in the Antichrist, Nietzsche does express hope regarding the prospects of masters, suggesting, for instance, the following. Quote. There is a continuous series of individual successes in the most varied places on earth and from the most varied cultures. Here, a higher type does in fact present itself, a type of overman in relation to humanity in general. Successes like this, real strokes of luck, were always possible and perhaps will always be possible. And whole generations, families, or peoples can sometimes constitute this sort of bullseye, right on the mark, end quote. Footnote 410 cites the source. Also, Nietzsche believes that the illusory nature of supernatural religions is becoming increasingly apparent thanks to society's increased interest in science, suggesting that, quote, there might still be no shortage of people who are unaware of the extent to which faith is indecent, of a, of a mark of decadence, of a broken will to life, but people will certainly be, be aware of this tomorrow, end quote, footnote 411 cites the source. Here, Nietzsche intimates that the fraudulent nature of religion will become more readily apparent as interest in science continues to increase. I will elaborate on this shortly. As this occurs, Nietzsche thinks that the continued endorsement of religion turns from somewhat innocent self-deception to something more egregious and devious, suggesting that, quote, the criminality of being Christian increases with your proximity to science, end quote. Footnote 412 cites the source. In the end, Nietzsche's prescription ultimately requires the abandonment of the slave mentality and the implementation of the master mentality. And I now turn to an analysis of what this process entails. Most instances of nihilism and the slave mentality are essentially rooted in what Nietzsche calls idealism. When faced with philosophical quandaries regarding the existence and perhaps regarding their existence and perhaps feeling helpless and or hopeless as a result, slaves fabricate ideals, traditional conceptions of morality, traditional philosophy and religions in order to cope with existence, generating the various forms of idealism. Nietzsche despises idealism, which for him denotes beliefs in various ideals that are thought to take on some kind of real or objective significance that signals something above or beyond the natural world for the sake of which believers often live their lives. In religious instances, for example, earthly life can be viewed as a kind of test to see who is worthy of eternal bliss in a life hereafter, 
In the Antichrist, Nietzsche expounds on what he, he thinks happens as a result. Quote, the truth of the matter is that the highly conscious conceit of being chosen is putting on airs of modesty here. People fir firmly put themselves, the congregation, the fair and the good on, on the one side, the side of truth, and everything else, the world, on the other. End quote. Footnote 413 cites the source. While these are ideals are thought to constitute, quote, the truth, they are, or end quote, they are in reality deceptions. This, in turn, is why Michael Hare suggests that, quote, nihilism is thus for Nietzsche the manifestation of an enormous lie, of delusion, and ultimately of despair, end quote. Footnote 414 cites the source. For Nietzsche, idealism reflects, among other things, one, quote, the real catastrophe of, this, of his life, uh, footnote 415 cites the source, two, quote, the greatest objection to existence, end quote, four, uh, footnote 416 cites the source, three, vice and anti-nature, footnote 417 cites the source, Four, life-preserving errors, footnote 418 cites the source, and a means of preservation, footnote 419 cites the source. Five, ignorance of oneself, uh, footnote 420 cites the source. Six, quote, the real riddle that the animal man poses for the philosopher, end quote, footnote 421 cites the source. Seven, quote, a source of misfortune and man's loss of value, end quote, footnote 422 cites the source. Eight, Quote, lies arising from the bad instincts of sick natures who were harmful in the deepest sense. End quote. Footnote 423 cites, uh, cites the source. And in some nine, quote, poisons. End quote. Footnote 424 cites the source. Ultimately, Nietzsche considers idealism to be not only illusory, but more importantly, unhealthy. Nietzsche considers the revaluation of all values essential on the road to, essential on the road to recovery from idealism or nihilism. But what, precisely, is this revaluation of, of values, and more importantly, how is it thought to cure nihilism? According to Nietzsche, the re revaluation of all values is, quote, the formula for an act of humanity's highest self-examination, end quote, footnote 425 cites the source, and indicates, quote, a courageous becoming conscious, end quote, footnote 426 cites the source. Hence, while, quote, not to know oneself, end quote, is the, quote, prudence of the idealist, end quote, footnote 427 cites the source, the revaluation of all values provides Nietzsche's patient with a strong dose of self-knowledge or self-consciousness. Nietzsche's patient must adopt a strict regimen of self-analysis, and Nietzsche maintains that this, his task is to prepare, quote, for humanity's most, moment of highest self-examination, a great noon, end quote, footnote 428 cites the source. What does self-knowledge or self-examination entail? In one word, honesty. First and foremost, this will require that Nietzsche's patient not be deceived by illusions, but instead unearth what lies behind them. Hence, Nietzsche's patient must evaluate these ideals critically and, in a sense, quote, see through himself in history, end quote, footnote 429, cites the source, as, quote, he who lets concepts, opinions, past events, and books step between himself and things will never have an immediate perception of things and will never be an immediately perceived thing himself, end quote, footnote 430, cites the source. On Nietzsche's view, all, quote, convictions are prisons, end quote. Footnote 431 cites the source. In essence, Nietzsche's patient must become a master, and he or she must cease indulging in the illusions of idealism. I will express some doubts regarding the efficacy of Nietzsche's prescription, i.e. the revaluation of all values. But first, I want to briefly discuss Nietzsche's views regarding the evaluation of, a, uh, I'm sorry, evolution of idealism and the stages of nihilism that correspond to this evolution, which I first alluded to in part four. Indeed, Nietzsche speaks as if there is a natural progression pertaining to nihilism, which, which can be likened to a play consisting of three acts. The on, one, the onset of idealism, what Gilles Deleuze, another prominent Nietzsche scholar, refers to as negative nihilism. Two, the devaluation of idealism, which is brought about in large part by increased interest in science and involves the self-destruction of negative nihilism. And three, the devaluation of all values, what De Deleuze calls reactive nihilism. All three stages are nihilistic in that they entail depreciation of earthly life. But for Nietzsche, the third stage reflects the decisive danger. Footnote 432. As we will, we will see, this is why Nietzsche's often misunderstood utterance, God is dead, is an expression of his apprehensions regarding an ideal and re religionless future. End of footnote 432. So again, that sentence reads, all three stages are nihilistic in that they entail depreciation of earthly life, but for Nietzsche, the third stage reflects the decisive danger, footnote 432, a complete disregard for life itself and the loss of all values. The first stage of nihilism consists 
consists of the onset of idealism. Again, Deleuze refers to the stage as negative nihilism, which, quote, signifies the value of nil taken on by life, the fiction of higher, i.e. otherworldly values, which give it this value and the will to nothingness which is expressed in these higher values, end quote, footnote 433 cites this work. The second stage of nihilism consists of the devaluation of these, often otherworldly ideals, such as heaven and hell. This stage marks the transition between negative nihilism and reactive nihilism, the final act in the nihilistic drama, and it's simil it is similar to Nietzsche's own revaluation of all values. In the second stage, the higher ideals positive in the first, posited in the first act are questioned and ultimately negated. As Deleuze puts it, the, quote, supersensible world and higher values are reacted against, their existence denied, end quote. Footnote 434 cites the source. Heidegger suggests that at this point, the, quote, decrepitude of the uppermost values edges towards consciousness, end quote. Footnote 435 cites the source. Finally, instead of negating unearthly ideals and affirming earthly life itself, reactive nihilism, Deleuze's term for the final act of the nihilistic drama, consists of negating both, a la Schopenhauer. Whereas negative nihilism depreciates worldly values while esteeming other worldly values, reactive nihilism depreciates all values, or deprecates all values. And consequently, the earth is no longer even valuable as a means to some higher end, let alone as an end in itself. The conclusion of the nihilistic drama demarcates nihilism in its most acute sense, as life, it's, it, as life is deemed completely devoid of value. This is why Nietzsche suggests that the death of idealism, quote, which no longer has any sanction after it has tried to escape into some beyond, leads to nihilism, end quote, footnote 436 cites the source. Now, quote, everything lacks meaning, end quote, end quote, the untenability of one's interpretation of the world, i.e. idealism, upon which a tremendous amount of energy has been lavished, awakens the suspicion that all interpretations of the world are false, end quote, footnote 437 cites the source. In turn, contempt and resentment toward life emerge thanks to the sense of futility, this is again reminiscent of Schopenhauer. With this, the drama has unfolded. In the beginning, the slave is faced with the confusing and chaotic abyss that defines his or her existence and the suffering implicit in it. Feeling helpless, the slave fabricates ideals by which he or she attempts to justify his or her existence. Inevitably, the process backfires, and the slave ultimately questions his or her own idealism. As a result, the slave then rejects these ideals and negates all values. As I suggested, Nietzsche stresses that as science becomes more influential in our everyday lives, the true nature of the slave's illusions, illusions will inevitably be revealed for what they really are. And as his derision for his contemporaries suggests, he thinks this has already happened to some extent. Indeed, Nietzsche predicts that the eventual demise of idealism will come as greater emphasis is placed on science and logic, and that a great noontide of consciousness will eventually arise. Additionally, he believes that this will, this will serve as a significant apex in human history, thanks to which his philosophy will attract a larger audience of potential free spirits. Ironically, this self-destruction of idealism is inherent in its own structure, most notably in the ideals of science and truth. Nietzsche believes that science itself entails idealism, insofar as its adherents possess, quote, the unshakable, unshakable faith that thought, using the thread of causality, can penetrate the deepest abysses of being, End quote. Footnote 438 cites the source. As a result, science, quote, speeds irresistibly towards its limits, where its optimism, concealed in the essence of logic, suffers shipwreck. End quote. Put for, footnote 439 cites the source. And finally, quote, logic coils up and bites its own tail. End quote. Footnote 440 cites, cites the source. Ultimately, the truth about reality, that there are no underlying objective truths, as existence is chaos and flux, is revealed, and there's a reaction against the futile nature of all forms of idealism. What occurs at this stage of the drama, that is, when idealism naturally self-destructs, is very, very similar to Nietzsche's own prescription, the revaluation of all values, which serves as the, as the quote, acts that will chop at the root of humanity's metaphysical need, end quote, footnote 441 cites the source. Nietzsche's revaluation of all values occurs when all pre predominant values are destroyed or transcended and new positive and life-affirming ones are constructed to replace them. Unfortunately, unless those involved in the second act of the nihilistic drama see the light, that is, unless they execute something like Nietzsche's own revaluation of all values and begin to value the earth, the antithesis of nihilism, the acts they wield will not sever the root of the problem, 
the dep deprecation of earthly life, and their efforts will actually generate a condition far worse than the one from which they began. Nietzsche himself is just as leery about this stage of the nihilistic drama because it generally leads to the third and final act, and he certainly does not consider the transition from negative nihilism to reactive nihilism to be a healthy one. How, then, are Nietzsche's patients to avoid this exact same fate? Optimally, Nietzsche's prescription, the revaluation of all values, is supposed to destroy all predominant values, i.e. nihilistic ones, and then construct new life-affirming values to replace them whereas the normal course of the disease will result in the absence of all values. But might this idealization of an aspiration for life affirmation be nothing more than a hopeful ideal? Does Nietzsche offer any additional instructions to help his patients avoid the typical nihilistic fate resulting from the second stage of the nihilistic drama? Kaufman expresses his doubts, writing that, quote, the result is less a solution of the initial problem than a realization of its limitations, end quote, footnote 442 cites the source. If Nietzsche cannot ensure that this dissolution of idealism does not yield reactive nihilism, then what was previously a minor infection could become far worse. Kaufman puts the point rather well. Quote, now it may be asked, if Nietzsche thus criticizes and helps to destroy prevalent values, does he not hasten the advent of nihilism? Does he, does he not help to bring about the catastrophic vacuum which he is prophesizing? End quote, footnote 443 cites the source. Expressing similar concerns, Copleston wonders whether there is, quote, in him and his philosophy, the embodiment of the very nihilism for, wh for which he professed to supply a remedy, end quote. Footnote 444 cites the source. To his credit, Nietzsche was not blind to the difficult nature of treating nihilism. Nietzsche recognized that, for many, lacking an ideal means lacking a sense of direction, and this can certainly be problematic. This is why he refers to idealism as entailing, quote, life-preserving errors, end quote. Footnote 445 cites the source and as a, quote, means for preservation, end quote, footnote 446 cites the source. And it explains the concerns underlying his famous admonition, admonition, God is dead. This is an expression he utters at various points in his works, including the gay science, footnote 447 cites the source, and thus spoke Zarathustra, for, footnote 448 cites the source, and is reflected in the following well-known passage from the gay science, quote, the madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried, I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how do we do this? How can we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we enchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as though through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? End quote. Footnote 449 cites the, source, cites the source. The proclamation, God is dead, is often misinterpreted because readers fail to take notice of what Nietzsche is referring to when making it, namely the problems that, arise, that would likely plague the atheistic society, which the madman hints at here. Sorry, the problems that would likely plague an atheistic society, which the madman hints at here. Again, these are problems that Nietzsche himself was very aware of and extremely concerned about. Indeed, while Nietzsche was certainly a non-believer and the persistent critic of religion, he anticipated a great void that would be left behind in the wake of God's death, i.e. the cessation of belief in God. Although religious individuals value life on earth for insufficient and invalid reasons, at least they still value life to some extent, insofar as it is necessary for the afterlife. Ultimately, Nietzsche is afraid that, with God's death, life will lose any value it once had for these believers. Interestingly, many hastily write Nietzsche off as a nihilist because they assume that, by eradicating all prior ideals and announcing that God is dead, Nietzsche implicitly denounces all values. However, as many scholars, such as Copleston, are quick to point out, quote, he does not mean to imply that all respect for values should be abandoned and all self-restraint thrown overboard, end quote. Footnote 440, or sorry, 450 cites the source. Again, in Nietzsche's opinion, we ought to ideally renounce all forms of nihilism and emphasize life itself. However, how, if at all, Nietzsche can avoid crushing all values, given the death of God and of idealism in general, must be duly considered. While Nietzsche's concept of the overman has been the subject of much debate in Nietzsche scholarship, it seems to me that the concept might be of use when trying to elucidate how Nietzsche hopes to promote a healthy revaluation of all values, while avoiding the similar devaluation of all values inherent in the transition from negative nihilism to reactive nihilism. And thus spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra tells a herd of men at the marketplace the following, quote, I teach you the overman, 
Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? The overman is the meaning of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth, and do not believe those who speak to you of otherworldly hopes. Poison mixers are they, whether they know it or not. Despisers of life are they, decaying and poison themselves, of whom the earth is weary, so let them go. End quote. Footnote 451 cites the source. We see here that the overman signifies, in essence, Nietzsche's master type. The overman rejects the idealism plaguing the slave mentality and, instead, remains faithful to the earth, embracing Nietzsche's naturalism and nothing more. Indeed, the overman is able to resist the usual temptations associated with his or her existential anxieties, such as indulging in illusions of ultimate pur purposes and objective standards. Consequently, the overman designates, quote, a type that, is, that has the highest constitutional excellence, in contrast to modern people, to good men, to Christians and other nihilists, end quote. Footnote 452 cites the source. Wicks, reflecting specifically on Thus Spoke Zarathustra, suggests the, fo the following with respect to Nietzsche's notion of the overman. Quote, Nietzsche also filled the work with nature metaphors, almost in the spirit of pre-Socratic naturalistic philosophy, which invoked animals, earth, air, fire, water, celestial bodies, plants, all in the service of describing the spiritual development of Zarathustra, a solitary, reflective, exceedingly strong-willed, sage-like, laughing and dancing voice of heroic self-mastery, who, accompanied by a proud, sharp-eyed eagle and a wise snake, envisions a mode of psychologically healthier being beyond the common human condition. Nietzsche refers to this higher mode of being as, quote, superhuman, end quote, ubermensch, ubermenschlich, and associates the doctrine of eternal recurrence, a doctrine for only the healthiest who can love life in its entirety, with this spiritual standpoint, in relation to which all too often downhearted, all too commonly human attitudes stand as a mere bridge to be crossed and overcome, end quote. Footnote 453 cites the source. In a sense, the overman overcomes what it means to be a human being, insofar as Nietzsche suggests in the gay science that a human being has, quote, one additional need, the need for the ever new appearance of such te teachers and teachings of a purpose, end quote. Footnote 454 cites the source. Indeed, whereas Nietzsche describes a human being as, quote, a fantastical animal, end quote, who, quote, has to believe, to know from time to time why he exists, end quote, footnote 455 cites the source, his overman must cease to ask the question why altogether, as this is what then spawns the problematic purposes and standards inherent in idealism. Only in this case does one cease to falsely judge the earth and truly value and represent earthly life as it is, and unstructured and at each moment becoming something entirely different. Ultimately, the overman no longer feels the need to judge life at all, and in the process, Nietzsche thinks he or she ascribes to life its greatest value. Hence, Nietzsche's overman accepts and embraces earthly life exactly as it is, and in doing so, exemplifies Nietzsche's formula for human greatness. Quote, Amari Fadi, that you do not want anything to be different, not forward, not backwards, not for all eternity, not just to tolerate necessity, but to love it. End quote. Footnote 456 cites the source. Footnote 457. I find it interesting that, that this represent or that this presents almost a mirror image of Soren Kierkegaard's formula for faith and the sickness unto death. Quote, by relating itself to its own self and by willing to be itself, the self is grounded transparently in the power which constituted constituted it, end quote. And I cite the source. That was uh, end of footnote 457. Nietzsche himself confesses, quote, I do not have the slightest wish for anything to be different from how it is, end quote. Footnote 458 cites the source. Thus, Nietzsche's overman provides us with a recipe for avoiding reactive nihilism while rejecting all instantiations of idealism, including the religious, namely, by ignoring existential anxiety and the question why as well as the answers provided by various forms of idealism. Naturally, it seems prudent to examine the practicality of this cure. Assuming his patient has already relinquished his diseased values, can Nietzsche convince, convince his patient to stop asking why altogether? Can he preclude the possibility that his patient will re relapse into a reactive, nihilistic stupor? How realistic are the prospects of becoming an overman? So again, that was part five of chapter two from... Frederick Nietzsche and the Antichrist from the Utility of Religion, Neil Nietzsche and James. Thanks.